Hey robot makers, hope you have a good day so far. So do you want to build a robot that will work with ROS, the robot operating system, but don't know where to start? Then I've got something to show you today. So let's dive straight in. My name is Kevin, come with me as we build robots, bring them to life with code and have a whole load of fun along the way. Right, let's get over to our keynote and make a start. So this is QB, I wonder why it's called QB, QB1. You'll also notice in the corner over there, the new logo for Kez Robots as well. You might also notice a little bit of background sound today. I've got my 3D printer working away to uh, to build the rest of uh, QB1. So you might hear a tiny bit of a uh, background noise there, but hopefully not too distracting. So yes, the session goals for today's session is about um, how we build this Raspberry Pi 4 uh, based ROS2 robot. And we're going to go over a couple of things as well about the, the new series. So we have touched on ROS before. I think I've done about three different videos, kind of a bit eclectic. And I thought, why not do a bit more of a series about how to use ROS? So what we'll do is we'll build this robot first. So we've got something to practice on and then we'll get into some how you actually use ROS2. ROS um, and I'm going to pick Python because that's my favorite language of choice. But you can use C++ with that as well. Um, but yeah, we're going to use uh, Python for a lot of the code. So we're going to look at this new ROS series, Learn, with, Learn ROS with me. And I say ROS, it's ROS2. Um, we're going to um, have a look at QB1, the new robot that I've been designing over the uh, Christmas and uh, New Year break. And uh, I've got, I'll show you the work in progress where it's up to. Uh, I'll take you through the 3D design, all the different parts. And as I've been learning how to design things in 3D, my skills have sort of been getting better and better, particularly at understanding before I even commit to 3D printing something, how something will fit together. So uh, I'll, I'll show you that the design for that. We'll have a look at how we're going to power this robot as well. Some of the electronics that are involved, some of the components like the Raspberry Pi and the motors and so on, and the sensors as well. We've got a really nice camera module to go on this. And for people who are watching this live, we'll have a bit of a live Q&A, a bit of a mailbox, um, and I'll cut that for the uh, people watching on playback. So if you want to watch that kind of thing, you'll have to uh, catch the live live video. So what's Learn ROS all about then? So this is a new series focusing on ROS2, the current release of uh, the robot operating system. So we're going to cover off in this series what is ROS, an overview of ROS, how to install ROS2, um, and we'll look at a couple of different options for that because uh, it seems to be quite temperamental depending on what platform you're on, whether it's a, a Raspberry Pi 64-bit, Raspberry Pi 32-bit, whether it's... Um, Raspberry Pi 4, a Zero, a Mac, a PC, a Linux machine, and so on. I think it particularly likes to be installed on Ubuntu, but I think we've got a way around that um, using Docker. Uh, we're going to have a write. Uh, we're going to have a go at writing a program in ROS2 as well, and uh, we're going to look at the ROS tool chain, all the different parts that make up uh, ROS, the robot operating system, because it's more of a collection of bits and bobs and frameworks. Uh, we're going to have a look at how ROS communicates. It's very similar to MQTT if you've ever done anything with that, with the uh, Internet of Things. And there's these things called launch files that help package everything together so you can start off many different um, nodes uh, in your ROS group. So we'll have a look at what all that means over the course. So today we're just going to have a look at so what is ROS and then build the robot. So a definition from the uh, Wikipedia, well, the, the wiki on uh, ROS.org. So they say ROS is an open source meta operating system for your robot. It provides all the services you'd expect from an operating system, including hardware abstraction, low level device control, implementation of commonly used functionality, message passing between processes and package management. And it also provides tools and libraries for obtaining, building, writing and running code across multiple computers. And that's the interesting thing with ROS. It doesn't necessarily have to run on just one computer. And uh, there's a question there from Dr. Baz about will ROS run on a Pico? So there is something called micro ROS, which is designed for edge based um, microcontrollers and very uh, low power compute devices. So what we'll be able to do with that, and this is something I fully intend to do. So I do have a, a time of flight sensor here, which I want to include in the robot once we've got it all built and everything, but actually have that connected to a Raspberry Pi Pico W or potentially an ESP32. Um, have that connected up there and just broadcast to the local area network um, what the readings are of that um, time of flight sensor or, or the uh, accelerometer, gyroscope and compass heading. It's more the compass heading than the gyroscope I'm interested in. 
and the reason i want to separate that is just to see how you can go about doing that but where there'll be latency issues and so on but uh, i just want to see you know in theory can we do that can we add loads of extra sensors to this robot but actually have them not physically connected but have them be transmit their messages in real time to the ROS network so we'll have a look at how to do that over the course of this series. So ROS, as I say, is programs that work together in a network. So we have this master node. Uh, that's the main uh, loop, if you like, that's going to be starting up all the other services. We'll have things like the messaging service. We'll have um, other nodes that provide bits of information, like this one that can log everything that you do. So there's like a logging service, a logging node. And what else is there? There's another one that can take all the messages and all the data that's being sent. It's called the bag. And you can basically play that back later on. So if you could, you can play it in a simulation in effect. Um, so think about ROS as being a collection of lots of different pieces of code, different programs that run together. And collectively, they can make um, your ROS program, your, um, your ROS service. So there is lots of distributions of ROS. This is one of the things that overwhelmed me a little bit when I first looked at it because there was ROS and ROS2. And there was lots of information about ROS, but not as much at the time for ROS2. And I thought, well, maybe some other programs only work on the original ROS and people haven't migrated yet. It's a bit like if uh, you ever did any Python programming a couple of years ago and there was Python 2 and Python 3 and they were slightly incompatible. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to pick the latest and greatest version of ROS, which is Humble Hawksbill. Uh, and that's got an end of life date of May 2027. So we've got a bit of time to uh, to get our teeth stuck into this one. And it's not too long ago since they released this one. And this is ROS2. So the the original ROS, again, has some incompatibilities. There are bridging things that, uh, that you can bring your code across. But the tool chain, how you build things is quite different. So we're going to be using um, Humble Hawks Bill for our ROS2 implementation. <clears throat> and I'm going to be... Flipping between using a Mac to do stuff because it's quicker, but then deploying stuff to the Raspberry Pi 4. And I've got the 8 gig, 8 gig version of the Raspberry Pi 4, and I'll talk about why I've chosen that particular processor and memory. Um, so that's what we're going to go with. And I might refer to ROS and ROS2 interchangeably. I mean ROS2 whenever I just say ROS. It's just easier sometimes. Okay, so... Getting ROS2 on a Raspberry Pi. So the objectives, what I want to do, what I want to get out of my particular learning journey with this robot, one of the reasons I built QB1. So I want to run ROS... Oop, let me just uh, turn off the uh, notifications there. Thank you, uh, Narcissus, for uh, joining there. Let me just uh, switch that off there. Okay, so yes, what I want to do is I want to install ROS on a 64-bit Raspberry Pi 4. So the 64-bit version of the Raspberry Pi OS means you can use all that extra memory. So if you've got like a, an 8 gig Raspberry Pi 4, you can use that top 4 gig as well as the bottom 4 gig. If you was only running on a 32-bit version, I think it caps it at the 4 gig version, uh, the 4 gig memory limit, and that's just to do with how many bits you can address in a 32-bit number. And I want to run this in a Docker container. Now, I did do a video about this previously, about how to run ROS in a Docker container. And you might think, well, why bother? Why make your life harder by running it in a container? Um, and it's because we can, we can develop the container. We can move that between different machines. And we can also script... Um, how to build that container so that it's very reliable. If we just install things, we might forget later on how to do that and it becomes difficult to replicate. So by making it um, a container, we can make a script to build the container and then I can share that with everyone. And it just means that you can run the same thing that I'm running. And if you come into any problems, it's easier to troubleshoot too. Uh, the second thing I want to do is add a camera um, as an input to the ROS2. So I bought the um, RGUCAM 16 megapixel uh, autofocus camera module, and that plugs into the Raspberry Pi 4, just like a regular camera. And that means we can do some things like object detection, um, object classification, all that kind of good stuff with, uh, with ROS. I'm going to add a LiDAR. So I have previously had a LiDAR working. I've got one, uh, I think it's uh, probably just um, behind me somewhere. It's the little yellow robot. I'll show you it in a second. And I'll tell you a bit more about that particular LiDAR module, just in case you're interested in it. Um, so I want to add that to the robot so that it can detect where it is in space. Um, it can map and it can localize where it is on that map. And I also want to, to use that SLAM as it's called, Simultaneous Location and Mapping. Um, I've not really used that in uh, earnest before. That's where my uh, ROS learning stopped when I was last looking at this. 
Uh, the next thing I want to do is create a simple program that will move our robot around using that Explorer hat. So the Explorer hat is like an add-on to the Raspberry Pi 4 that gives a motor driver to our motors. Uh, I want to create some extra sensors, so that one I've just mentioned about this uh, 9 degrees of uh, freedom gyroscope, accelerometer and compass, so it can measure in all three dimensions, so X, Y and Z for the gyro, X, Y and Z for the accelerometer, and also X, Y and Z for the compass. So combining all those three together, we can get some really accurate information about which direction um, and where in space our robot is. I want to in, um, investigate some machine learning on ROS2 as well, so do the object um, detection and classification. We have previously looked at that with the Jetson Nano, that's pretty much designed for that kind of purpose. Uh, and I understand that ROS2 can do this too, so we might be able to take a video feed or an images and have that offload to a faster computer like the Mac for example, and then we can then pass back the information into that node network, that uh, ROS network. The next thing I want to do is add our AI assistant that we've been building into the robot so we can do voice synthesis and uh, voice recognition. So we can sort of say to our robot, stop, go, move left, go to that, follow me, that kind of thing. And finally, I want to add some extra sensors using MQTT. So I want to bridge between MQTT and this ROS, net, um, ROS node. And I believe there are some um, nodes that already do this, so I might be able to borrow that. And I want to also investigate the micro ROS for the Pico, which we mentioned a little bit earlier when Dr. Baz asked that question. Okay, so let me just uh, move to the next one. So QB1, this is the, the robot I've been working on um, over the past couple of days. So this is a new robot for use with ROS2. Uh, this is a nice little render that I did in Fusion 360. I didn't actually go out to the middle of the desert or some random parking lot that looks like. This is all uh, computer generated imagery, but I do have a real one next to me here. So this has a Raspberry Pi 4 8 gig. Now the reason I went for an 8 gig, the very first ROS robot I built was based on the Raspberry Pi 2W. And that only has half a gig of RAM. And I thought, well, that's fine. What I'll do is I'll just put um, a brand new SD card in there and I will create a virtual memory file. Now, when you do that, the SD card will get hit thousands of times a second, possibly even more. Uh, and eventually that will wear out the card. They're not really designed to be written to like that with virtual memory. So you need as much memory as you can. And I found that if you didn't have the virtual memory, ROS would basically just kill the machine. It would run out of real time memory and it would just stop. The OS would crash. So I thought the next computer, the next robot that I build with ROS has to have as much RAM as is humanly possible on a single board computer. So I've gone for the eight gig um, Raspberry Pi 4 and I had to go and pick one of these up from the Cambridge store um, in the UK. I've also gone for the Arducam 16 megapixel autofocus uh, camera module and the reason I went for this one is because of the autofocus. One of the problems I've had in the past with doing object detection and image recognition is these camera modules, the, I've got one on a, um, a little camera that I built here, these standard Raspberry Pi cameras um, are a little bit poor when it comes to doing object detection and so on. We need a, a better quality image and the autofocus means that we can, uh, we can make sure that our image is always in focus as well. The LiDAR means that we can map the room that we're in or the environment. We can uh, accurately create a, a map in real time of where we are and then place our robot within that. And that means that we can then do some really cl clever um, routing and planning. So we can say, go over there on the map and the robot will figure out how to do that based on objects in real time. We've got the uh, Pimroni Explorer hat. That means we can have um, motor drivers on our Raspberry Pi 4. So we, we've got four motors on the, the bottom of the robot and essentially one half will be like the left half, one half will be the right half and they'll move a bit like a tank. So um, if you make one side go forward and one side go backwards, it'll turn. So that's what we're going to use for the, uh, the motor driver. For the motors themselves, I've got a whole bunch of N20 motors. These are the very small um, like micro metal motors um, and they're very reliable. I've used these in pretty much every robot that I built to date. So just two wires required for that to the motor driver. And I also have a 5,000 uh, milliamp battery pack, which I think I have this little pack next to me here. So I've got a little project box of uh, bits and bobs that I've not yet uh, attached to the robot. And this is the, the battery pack that I'm going to be using. This is a, a two power. So this was also from Pimroni. They've got them in, uh, in store. So it's essentially just an 18650 with a bit of circuitry on there and two connectors. So it's got like regular USB and a USB-C connector on there as well. And they're, they're quite powerful and quite compact as well. 
And obviously we're going to be installing ROS2 on this robot as well. Okay, so the design of this robot. I love this uh, depth of field effect. You can do in Fusion 360 on your renders as well. It really makes uh, for nice imagery there. So I've designed the whole robot in, in Fusion 360. And the way that I go about designing robots now is I will get all the parts that I'm going to physically use. So I will model up, for example, this battery pack. I will model up a Raspberry Pi 4. I will go to GrabCAD, download the file itself. And then I can use that as like real world dimensions and place them into the model to make sure the placement works. Um, it works most of the time. And then that gives me an idea of how big this robot needs to be. Um, so I've gone for a cube design this time because it's quite a simple uh, structure to, to sort of design in 3D. And it means we've got quite a bit of space as well. So one of the, the challenges I've had in the past is I'll make a robot just big enough for all the parts that are needed and no bigger. Uh, whereas this QB one's got quite a bit of space inside. So in fact, we could have quite a few battery packs. We could have about four or five of these in there and it would be fine space wise. Um, it also means it's quite a rigid design and we can design it in, in a series of flat sections. If you think about a cube, it's just six flat planes. So that means that we can 3D print this pretty quickly. Um, the e it's easy to exchange the parts as well. So if we decide we want to have like a, a different front to it or that the front that we printed wasn't quite right in some way, which I will have to print, I'll talk you through that in a we'll look at the demo. Uh, and it means it's easier to do that because all these modules can sort of be simply unscrewed and then put back in place. And the whole thing is put together with captive nuts and we'll have a look what they look like uh, in a moment too. So the base, this is the, the very first part of the robot. So I like to go with a nice flat base. This one's got a few different indentations on it. So the very edges are slightly sort of carved out. And that means these pillars that are gonna go into the corners and be screwed from underneath, uh, they can sort of locate themselves, but with a single screw. If I didn't have those little carved out areas, when I put the pillar there and screwed it from underneath, it would probably twist and I didn't want that to happen. So I wanted needed to sort of lock into place and it, it does that exactly the way I want. It has those little tabs as well for the, uh, the, the wheels just to make them pushed out enough on the, the sides of the robot so that the wheels where they connect to the um, to the little tab it's got enough sort of clearance from the side of the robot. Being a single piece means it's flat it's very quick to print so it's just three millimeters high um, and I think this one printed in, in about three hours and I had it on um, uh, I, I think about standard setting on uh, Cura Alex, could you just uh, press that little green button for me? We can turn off that printer now. It's now finished doing the uh, the top section. We can have a look at that on the, the robot shortly as well. Um, yeah, so three millimeters thick, it's very quick to print because it's just a single layer. It's not very complicated. And it's a solid foundation for all the bits and pieces that we want to stick on our robot. And the holes are pretty standard throughout this design. They're all three um, so M3, not 3M, M3 um, machine screws. Uh, various different sizes. I think I've put my box of screws away actually, but I've got um, I've got several of these uh, boxes, different heights, um, but they're all pretty much standard. Um, so yes, they're all standard. That means we can secure everything to this base and uh, away we go. So next is the pillars. So these pillars started out as just very simple columns. And then as I've developed the robot, I've decided that this is a really great place to put some captive nut tabs so that we can secure all the different parts to um, to these pillars. So the pillars form part of the superstructure of the robot. You can see there there's sort of um, a bottom section where there's some screws, then there's a top section and there's actually a shelf that will go onto the, uh, the middle section there, which is what the LiDAR sits on top of. So really the shelf was just designed to have the LiDAR just peeping out the top of the robot's head um, because we need to have like a completely 360 degree clear unobstructed view for the LiDAR to sort of spin round. Uh, this means we can now attach the side panels and the front panels to the robot. Again it's very quick to print these. I actually printed them sort of top to bottom. I tried printing them sort of lengthways on the printer. Uh, it didn't really work very well. It was much better to just sort of print it as a, as a tall structure as you see it there. And again, everything's secured with um, these captive nuts. Next is the pie holder. So that's that little thing that's just popped up um, just here on the screen. Um, so this is for the Raspberry Pi 4 to secure to the base. I did this as a separate part just in case I decide to use a different computer. So if I wanted to use a Jetson Nano, for example, you know, I could replace the Raspberry Pi 4 or if I wanted to have a Raspberry Pi Zero, 
or potentially a new one, who knows. Um, it'd be very easy to do that. We just have to print out a new holder um, and then that could just secure to the base. It also gives a bit of height to the um, um, to the Raspberry Pi 4 and therefore airflow can go underneath and on top of the board rather than it just being completely secured to the base uh, without any airflow because they do get quite hot there. Again, these very quick to print. They can be swapped out if the other um, SBCs come out. Um, but for now, I'm uh, quite happy with the Raspberry Pi 4. So next is the Raspberry Pi 4 itself. You can see there it uh, takes up most of the area there, but there's a nice area to the side of it where we can put the battery pack. I designed it so that the, uh, the battery pack and the Raspberry Pi 4 could sit side by side. Uh, again, I've gone with the uh, the 8 gig version of the Raspberry Pi 4 and I'm using the full 64 bit operating system on there too. And uh, yeah, that's going to power the, it's going to provide the processing power for our robot. Again, the Raspberry Pi 4 has M2.5 screw holes in it. At a push, you can screw in an M3 screw. It's just a bit of a bit of a tight fit, but um, you can do it. <laughs> so if you like these videos, please make sure you give this video a like. Um, drop me a comment. If uh, Let me know if you know ROS, if you've studied ROS before, or if this is something that's new to you and you want to know more about. I'm very interested to know your experience with ROS and ROS2. And if you've not already subscribed to the channel, please subscribe. Uh, it really helps the channel grow and get in uh, front of other people as well. And I do go live every single Sunday at seven o'clock GMT. So if you want to check out the live, you can do. Uh, I shall see you on the lives. OK, back to the um, the content. So the next is the shelf. This is this uh, white section that's just appeared on um, on top of the pillars there. So this is really for the LiDAR to sit on top of and just give it the correct height. Um, it means we've got the unobstructed view so the, the LiDAR can spin round. But also it gives a bit of rigidity to the middle section of the robot. So we've got the base, we've got the middle, and then we'll have the top. And that means that we can uh, really have this robot as a nice rigid cube, but completely disassemblable if you want to. No disassemble. Uh, and again, it's very quick to print because it's just a flat piece. I provided some holes in there. There's like four great big holes, and that's just, again, for airflow. But also, if there's any wires that we later want to introduce, we can put them in there because other than the LiDAR, there's nothing else on that shelf. And there's quite a bit of space between the shelf and the, the top of the Raspberry Pi 4. There's a couple of inches there. And there's also a little cutout for the camera. So I'll show you the camera module. Um, so that little cutout section there is just for the camera to, uh, to sort of sit there. OK, the LiDAR itself, the RP LiDAR, that's going to go on top. That has four uh, standoffs at the bottom. So I've just uh, put that in place, cut the holes out uh, on the shelf and had it at a slight angle. It's kind of slightly twisted just so that it fits nicely in the, uh, the space that's needed. And the, it connects to the Raspberry Pi 4 via either USB or it can connect via some GPIO. So I'm just going to have a look at which is best. I know from an aesthetic point of view, be best if all the wires were internal but currently it's uh, it's got a little extra serial to usb board and then the usb cable comes out and just plugs into the raspberry pi 4 and it does just work but i'm pretty sure i can disconnect that and just have the wires go direct to the raspberry pi 4 instead and there are uh, ros drivers available for this particular model too Next is the top section, and that's just literally finished printing out my printer over there. Uh, and again, that provides the rigidity. It's nice aesthetic to tidy off that. It's got a great big hole on the top for the LiDAR to sort of fit through. So another flat design, meaning it's very quick to print. And as it says there, there's a large hole for the LiDAR to peek through. And then there's the camera module. So we can use any number of camera modules. They're all very similar in uh, in in sort of shape and uh, mounting holes. So this uh, this is a standard Raspberry Pi um, version 2.1 module. I'll just show you that on the screen there. So uh, you can see that one's just on this little um, camera that I've, I've designed. The other one that I have here, which is also from RGCam, is a time of flight. So I've actually not got this working yet. So this one is a time of flight, time of flight camera. And it has a number of different um, cells in it so there's like a number of um like an array of lasers that fire out but we've got the lidar so it'd be a bit pointless having two lidars i think in place there so why not go with a regular camera we could have used the raspberry pi high quality camera module so this one has got a great big lens on there and these lenses can be unscrewed and there's a whole i've got a whole number of lenses that we can put in place there if we wanted to do that but i've actually gone with the Aducam autofocus 16 megapixel camera 
and again that's because we get that benefit of it's always going to be a sharp image and that means that things like face detection object classification will be a lot easier to do and it connects using the standard raspberry pi csi camera interface then we have the camera holder so this is the um the thing that the camera module connects into and it's also like a face plate for the front of the robot protects from sort of dust and bits and pieces just uh i don't know water or whatever just uh, getting at the rest of the design it's flat it's got a bit of a um, flare on there made it look a bit like a star wars robot and uh, again this is secured using four m3 nuts as well then we have the lower face plate not sure if these are all going to be the same color yet or whether it's going to be the nice blue color uh, again this hides the innards it's a flat design so it's quick to print and it can be secured with uh, two m3 nuts and bolts as well again it follows the same kind of design thing as well then we've got the side panels these are a slightly different design so again they hide the innards but they also provide some airflow to the raspberry pi 4 so there's two on either side and they have this um it's like a diamond cutout or a cube sort of rotated a square rotated at 45 degrees 60 degrees something like that and um, this just means that we can have a bit of airflow it looks a bit interesting as well I've not printed this one yet so we'll see how that one goes um, i'm expecting to print this flat on the bed um, so it's again three millimeters thick i think it's either three or 4.5 millimeters thick um, and there's a very slight lip to the edge as well so you might be able to see on the design there there's like um there's a flat section and there's also like a little lip there and that just means that we can push this in place secure it with a number of screws and it'll be pretty rigidly secured in there it's flat it's quick to print so i'm happy the motor holders these are the uh, the bottom of the I've just got a couple here of a previous model i've uh, used so these are like a little um, holder for the motor so the motor can sit in this little section here there's some captive nut areas if i just show you this you can see this sort of a hexagonal inset these are not the best printed ones but um, that means we can use some m3 nuts and then because of the design is exactly the same as the size of the nut they sort of squeeze into place and are really pretty secure so if you put a bolt through that um, it means that that's not going anywhere it's a really solid design they're really easy to design these as well so um I've, I've used them on quite a few robots now and they're a reliable design so they hold the motors in place and they attach to the bottom of the base and um, quite cleverly <laughs> the uh, the screws that go through these one of the screws also goes into the pillar so it secures the pillar the bottom section the base and the uh, the motor holder with just one screw so that was a nice design feature there and the finished model looks a bit like this there are some other panels to go on the side i just haven't added them to it and i'll tell you about that as well so when i'm designing a robot i will typically just start putting things together in fusion 360 and it, it's that same philosophy of make it work make it right make it fast so with a design i'll make it first of all quite clumsily i'll not label the uh, the sketches inside fusion 360 and sometimes I make mistakes where I've not put the sketch inside the component and it's all over the place, but that doesn't matter. What matters is figuring out what the dimensions are going to be for each of the components. And once I figure that out, I can then recreate this in a brand new separate file and I can make each individual component on its own and then assemble them all together in one single design. And then if I want to tweak the wheels or anything, I can do that as an individual component. Um, and I know that everything will fit together because I've already tried it out in the in the sort of rough sketch that I originally did. So that's what I've done here and the side panel, the sort of top side panel, this area here, um, that's just one I hadn't got round to to doing for the render. But everything else is is as it should be. So you can see there's some additional upper side panels and the rear panels are available, just not added them to this model. And we've got these buggy wheels as well. I've actually got the thinner version. The model that I originally modeled is the sort of double width version. Um, you can actually double the wheels up, just get two of the thin ones and attach them together. They even provide screws for that. But I've just for now just gone with the, the thin wheels just just because it was easier but i really like these moon buggy wheels because they give a really good grip on most surfaces indoors and outside okay on uh, most surfaces if it's reasonably flat as well okay so power wise like i said we've got a number of different options we could use a um, a bunch of 18650s and a charge module i do have one um, 
at the back of the room over there that I could go and get and show you. That's got uh, two 18650s in there and all the charging circuitry. That would very easily sit inside this robot, no problems at all. And um, what I've done for now, just because it's like a nice contained unit, is I've just used this uh, Power 2 um, USB power bank, which is 5,000 milliamp hours. And my experience says that that runs the, the Raspberry Pi 4 for at least an hour, which is more than enough time that I need for this particular project. Um, so I think they're available on the Pimroni uh, website if you're interested. I, th I think there is an issue with um, shipping batteries overseas, though, so you might have to find something that's similar if you want to use this. And it's exactly the same um, battery module that I use inside these uh, cameras as well. So I actually designed these cameras around that battery module. Or that orientation um, so that was uh, I, had the, I had the dimensions to hand because of that model uh, the explorer hat is a, a again a module that i've used before again this is from pimeroni uh, this just fits on top of the raspberry pi 4 using the 40 pin header and it gives us a whole load of uh, inputs and outputs so we've got the two motors which is essentially the left and right side we have some other outputs we've got some inputs and there's some analog inputs as well Really, we're just using this for the motors, so um, that's what I've gone for. I had a few of them, and they're quite cheap as well, and they, and they work. They're reliable. The camera, this is the Arducam 16 megapixel autofocus. I'm not sure why the Explorer thing's still there. I think I just haven't taken that away. We can see on the uh, the right-hand side there, this is the uh, the camera. I basically just put it on with some blue tack before I printed out the uh, the camera holder. We'll have a look at that in a second in uh, on the demo. And the LiDAR module. So this is the LiDAR module that I, I purchased quite a while ago. So it's by RP LiDAR by Slamtech. It rotates um, at 5 to 10 hertz depending on uh, which setting you have. So 10 times a second, 5 times a second. It doesn't actually have to be that fast. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, there's just like a little motor, a rubber band, and then this LiDAR module. And what I find fascinating is how does it communicate the settings or the how does it even yeah, com communicate the power, the readings and so on from a device that hasn't got wires? So it must be done optically. That's uh, that's what I'm guessing there. It has an eight meter range, so it's a really good throw of the uh, the light, the laser. And this is the kind of thing that you'll see on um, uh, vacuum cleaners, robot vacuum cleaners. They'll have like a little LiDAR uh, on the top that sort of pops out. And this will take 2,000 to 4,000 samples per second, which is just insane. And that's why it's so accurate. If you think it's taking that many and it's only spinning around at, say, five times a second, that's a lot of information that it's getting there. And it provides that information as just a whole series through the USB serial connection, um, <clears throat> essentially saying I'm at this angle and this is the depth that I'm currently reading. And now at this angle, this is the depth I'm reading. And now at this angle, this is the depth I'm reading. So you just get a whole sort of continuous... Um, flow of that uh, information and they're about 90 pounds i think i paid 89 pounds plus shipping for this particular one and it just works it's really reliable um, and it comes with this little uart um, to usb connector or you can just use straight uart just to serial transmit and receive and that's what i'm probably going to try and do inside the robot just get rid of the usb for convenience and just use the direct to the uh, to a uart so how does LiDAR actually work? So it's like a rotating rangefinder. We've used rangefinders on all our robots previously. These are the little ultrasonic um, devices that can ping out a sound and then that sound bounces back to the, uh, the microphone and it can therefore work out. If I sent it at this time and it took that time to get back, half that time you've got the distance. So the motor in the, um, the LiDAR will spin the, the belt. It will spin the LiDAR unit round and the LiDAR is actually on a bearing, so it has a very, very low friction. It basically can spin uh, without any um, uh, yeah, sort of resistance, essentially. And the laser light will reflect of any objects and bounce back 40,000 times per second, which is just insane. And the distance is essentially measured, is halved, and then therefore... Um, sorry, the distance that it takes, if you think it goes from one point to another and then back again, halve that and you've got the actual distance. So this is how the, the LiDAR unit works. <laughs> I'm sure you get the idea there. And uh, they're also called time of flight because it's how long the light is taken to bounce and bounce back. So the laser sends out a modulated pulse that's reflected off an object comes back to the, uh, the sensor, the light sensor. The distance is then calculated by taking the speed of light, halving it, and then you get your distance. 
and you don't really even have to take into effect the uh, the rotation because it happens so quickly the rotation is so slow in comparison um, that it doesn't even have to factor that in but we have got this uh, theta uh, in this little thing here which just means we can figure out what angle we're currently pointing out which object we're currently looking at and if you look at this from some sort of an overhead perspective um, you'll see there we, we end up with a point cloud we end up with a whole series of two-dimensional coordinates and if we join them together if we say every point that's within a certain radius of another point if that touches it then we can consider that a solid uh, and that's what we do and you get a lot of points <laughs> so that's how we come up with this point cloud and Ros will help the um, image that for us we can actually visualize that in what one of the tools like Arv is uh, and it's quite magical when you see your room suddenly appear and it's sort of jittering and moving around and you can play around with the point size and all that kind of stuff and then based on that you can then say right you know where the robot is move the robot forward and it will figure that out so um, really love lidar it's a really nice technology right so demo time let's get over to the uh, the bench so if i go to my overhead here so I've got my uh, my robot here and I'm just going to rotate it around and I'll show you a few different views as well. So currently, um, currently I've just put the motors in place. There's the motor holders. There's the screw that goes into the, uh, to the pillar there. I've not screwed in the other ones just because I literally did this before the, uh, the show started. So these are not actually secured yet and they're not actually wired up. We can see there the hole is where the wires will go through and then they will come through to the to the top here and this is where i'm showing you that the top here and this is where the um um the explorer hat will go just there so you can see the columns you can see the shelf that's there these four holes here i can actually remove that blue tag now these are where the lidar will sit the lidar is just in the other part of the uh the workshop and this is the uh, the camera module so you can see there it's just secured with um, two screws now one of the things i do need to reprint on this because this front section is probably less than a millimeter thick it's really really thin and it's actually started to um, show through there i don't know if you can see there's like little marks uh, which means it doesn't look great um, up close and also the uh, the word QB, which you can't see very easily on there um, that also doesn't look great either currently so I might reprint that piece but um, this this often happens when you're designing things you just need to go back and tweak them and it's only a single piece so it's very quick to print and you can see here this is what I was saying about the uh, there is a very slight one 1.5 millimeter um, tab there and it on all four sides they have the same sort of indentation there and this means that this sort of fits into place doesn't go past that point and is uh, pretty secured in there and we've got these four um, screws holding everything in place and the captive nuts if I flip this over you can see there there is a there's a nut that's held in place by a hole that's exactly the same shape as the uh, um, as the nut itself on the, the motor holder and when we put a screw through there it'll screw into place and they'll be really securely held in place so currently the the raspberry pi just got its life support on here so i've got a network cable so i can actually connect to it um, and i'm just powering it from a an external power supply as well but there's more than enough space in here for the battery to go i'll just go and grab the battery uh, so one of the things i hadn't considered is when i put the battery in here um, the cable's kind of sticking out at a bit of a, a, a janky angle. I don't really like that, so I might have to consider a better way of uh, of powering this. Um, so there's there's a few different options there, but there's so much room in in here, it's not going to be a problem. We can you can see if I just sort of tilt it side on there. There's more than enough room in there to have sort of several of these batteries. So I can spin that round, can have it in that kind of orientation if I wanted to. Inside, plenty of options there so that's uh, great and then on here there's plenty of space for the for the lidar to go because it's been designed for that and the camera module you can see there this little cutout was just to make sure there's plenty of space there and that the cable can uh, nicely sort of curl up inside there and you can see that these these tabs they're going to hold the side places just like this one in place and um and there's also the top section which is literally just finished printing i'll just go and grab that So here we go. I've got the uh, the 3D printed piece just come fresh off the uh, the printer. I need to refresh these uh, these build plates. They're, uh, they're 
quite quite marked badly there so i think i need to uh to, to get a new couple of those and um yeah there's a little bit of stringing there but this usually happens with the uh, 3d printed parts i just want to try and find some uh, pliers but basically we can just pull that off there and that's just going to hold in place like so uh, so if i just hold this up you can see what that will look like like so so this has got a very slight curvature to it you can just see on the edge there very slight curvature to it and that means that um it just aesthetically looks nice and there's plenty of room there for the lidar to sort of pop out um like so so if i just put that inside you can see what that's going to look like so it's actually not quite a cube it's 110 by 110 but then height wise it's 90 so it's not quite a, um, a cube and that was because the lidar pokes out a little bit and i wanted it to be roughly the right size there um, what else did i want to talk to you about on here as well um i've got a list of notes here so let me just have a look if there's anything else i needed to tell you about so yeah the motor wires i've not done those yet the explorer hat i've not um, i've not soldered that up yet so the the explorer hat is to be soldered in place uh, the side panels and the the top they just need to be printed out and uh, screwed into place and um, obviously the arduo cam um, the driver for that i need to to get working that's currently not working at all so i need to figure out what's going on there and obviously i need to figure out how to use um to use ros in docker as well because excuse me it's been a while since i've uh, done that so you can see for size there if i can sort of hold this up here that's how big the robot is looks a bit smaller than you'd imagine from the renderings i think i imagined it'd be a little bit bigger than that but um, it's perfectly sized for what it needs to do so there we go let's put that back on there and there's a alternate view you can just see from the other camera there it's a little bit over overexpose this camera but there's not a lot i can do about that so you can see there how that's going to work great so it's a work in progress um i'll be working on this um just in the spare time just printing all the different parts i've got both printers working so i can print at the same time and it's just the panels really to put in place and simultaneously while that's printing out i can be um both learning a bit more ROS from uh, some online tutorials i'm following and then writing that up and sharing that with you in this series of videos too okay so let's get back to our keynote okay and let's get over to the next thing so yes if you haven't joined our discord server yet head over to kevsrobots.com slash discord and you can get a sign up link there as well and they also ask you for your email address and that's just so that we can uh, include you if you want in our weekly newsletter i say weekly i always forget to send it and alex always types it up for me so we will definitely send it out because uh, it's the new year and uh, if you want to follow me on social media, I'm all on the social medias. So on TikTok, I'm Kevin McAleer 6 I've had some real stonkers on there. There's been um, one video that's had over 4,000 um, views now, 400,000 views, which is just insane. Uh, one thing's had over 100,000 views as well. Uh, and that was the, um, the the radar robot that we built, the sonar robot. I'm on uh, Instagram as well, so Kevin McAleer on Instagram. Kev's Mac on Twitter and I'm Kev's Mac at Mastodon Social on Mastodon as well. So follow me if you're not already follow me. I'll uh, you'll get in touch and we can uh, um, share interesting pictures of robots and so on. If you want to support the show as well, there's a couple of different ways you can do that. So if you're watching this now live on the chat, you can do a, um, a super chat uh, and I'll switch the super chats back on. Uh, and that means that people can uh, get a shout out if they... Uh, if they uh, they do a super chat if you i shall have a look at the, the comments in a second alex yeah thanks and um if you want to do a super chat uh, sorry super thanks that's if you're watching this on the replay if you're watching this after the live has finished you can do a super thanks as well and if you go over to kedgerobots.com slash coffee you can buy a coffee as well uh, i release all the files for all the projects that i build such as these uh, pecan cameras all the different robots that i built in the past and certainly the um, qb1 files will be released as well once i printed them out and made sure that they're as they should be so if you want to help support the show you can buy a coffee and alternatively you can also go over to the youtube membership um so next year after you've subscribed i think there's like a join button appears and you can click that and um yeah you can join the channel that way okay so let me just get my mouse it just disappeared there we go 
So yes, supporters, I shall show you the supporters that we have to date. So here we go. <laughs> Always make sure this animation works properly. Yes, there we go. So let's go for our YouTube members first. We've got Bill Hoy, we've got uh, Dale from Hybrid Robotics, we've got Hans from Cheerlights, we've got Michael, Fraser, uh, Jose, um, Johan, John Paul and Tom. And then on our members, we have Keith, we have uh, Shemi, we have Steve and Tom. And then our supporters, these are people who bought coffees uh, in the past month. I only cap it for the last sort of 30 days. So we have uh, David, we have uh, Shroomy, Derek, RGS, we've got um, uh, Roland, we've got Bill and we've got Alex as well. So thank you so much for the coffees and the support it really makes a difference to the channel. It means I can go out and buy more robot stuff and make more robots and make more videos about robots. <laughs> so it's a win-win for everyone. So if you want to get your name in these credits, you can also go to kedsrobots.com slash credits and you can uh, learn about how to, to do all the things there. Okay, let me go back over to my keynote and I think that is it for the, the show notes today. So this is the part of the video where I'll say thank you so much for watching if you're watching this on replay and I shall see you next time.